universal art of all time, Pablo Ruiz Picasso. Our speaker today is Jens van Hensbergen, uh, one of the most qualified experts on the life and work of Picasso. As Jimmy Burns, chairman to the British Spanish Society, who will later online illustrate it greater, in greater, greater detail later. From my side, I would like to tell you that uh, Jens van Hensenberg uh, is a Dutch art historian, food critic, and Hispanist. After training in the Court Courtauld Institute of Art, uh, University of London, he worked at the Nudele Gallery uh, in London and New York. Following this, he made the somewhat uh, ex ex uh, eccentric decision to devote, fi uh, devote five years of his life to the art of the master chef at the Chene de Gotisse, uh, a sucking pig specialist in Segovia, Spanish. James van Heisenbergen is now the Grand Knight of the Noble Order of the Silver Whisk. <laughs> Regarding his very extensive academic career and as a lecturer, it is worth mentioning him as a Harry Ransom Research Fellow at the University of Texas in Austin in 2011 and guest lectures at the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, University of Bristol, Museo del Prado, Queen Sophia Institute, Institute in New York, Seattle Art Museum, Cheltenham Literary Festival, Dulwich Picture Gallery, Museo Nacional de Arte Contemporáneo, Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, National Gallery in London, Hay Festival at Y and also Segovia, University of Castilla-La Mancha, and the prestigious El Escorial Summer School de la University Complutense from Madrid. Finally, I would like to mention his contributions in a project and TV work, including his collaboration with John Richardson, A Life of Picasso, 2010-2012, or the main interviewee, uh, as a main interviewee, interviewee <laughs> sorry, my English today, of Lara Logan's inspirational CBS 60-minute profile of Gaudí's breakthrough Sagrada Familia, God's Architect. The Hesi Reicher Rundfunk, this is a challenge to me, <laughs> this is so many, 40-minute uh, documentary of Jesch Hensbergen uh, in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2007, focus on his writing of Guernica, the biography of, of a 20th century icon and Czech Board Film Foundation interviews John, John Richardson, The Art of Picasso in 1933 and 1973 in New York. He appears frequently on BBC4 and Radio4, TV3 from Spain and TV3, TV, Spanish TV uh, also in Spain. He has also written articles in The Guardian, The Times, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, El País, La Vanguardia, uh, Country Life, Apollo, The Burlington Magazine, Vogue, The Independent, and Restauradores, among uh, many others. Without, without any further delay, I would like to hand over now to Jimmy Burns, who is online uh, chairman to the British uh, Spanish Society, and say to him, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us this amazing uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Jimmy, cuando quiera. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Okay. Uh, I suppose I'm unmuted and, and, and seen. Uh, if I'm not, you can message me madly. Um, uh, I was just going to say a few words. That, um, well, in fact, I'm going to say la uh, bienvenida en español y luego hablar en inglés, porque estoy consciente que hay presente amigos y, y miembros que uh, que son muy hispanistas, pero que no entienden bien el castellano así, y creo que Carlos va, va a estar haciendo su lecture en in English. Um, uh, after that short introduction in, in Spanish, I was just in, in deference to, uh, uh, to one of the universal languages, not the only one uh, by any means, um, and in deference to those of you who cannot understand Spanish, um, I'm breaking into, into, into English now. 
Um, on behalf of the British Spanish Society, I'm delighted to, to be with you, uh, if only remotely, and that's because I've got my bags packed and about to jump on a plane uh, to my beloved Sitges. Um, I wanted, before I get on to guide um, on, on a personal and professional level, I just wanted to obviously thank um, Victor uh, and Juan Blas and his team at, uh, at the Cervantes. It, it is really wonderful, the, um, uh, the cooperation agreement that we signed over a year ago with his predecessor, Ignacio Peiro, which obviously is, is developing the whole time uh, with Victor. Um, one of, the th one of the great lessons we all learned with, with the pandemic um, was that if we're to pull through it and beyond it, um, th th there is a, a huge positivity in finding uh, new relationships, building new relationships, uh, cooperative ag agreements, um, which play to the strengths of the respective signatories. Um, and, and there's no doubt at all that the Cervantes and the British Spanish Society for many, many years um, have been cooperating, but we've never really formalized our, our relationship to the extent that we we're doing now. And I think it's very positive, not just for those of you who go to the Cervantes regularly, but those for our members, because it's a really kind of wonderful cross current of, of, of the best that can be delivered in cultural terms and in terms of uh, how we project ourselves in, in this country and, and in Spain. Uh, and I know, as Victor knows, that this has a full uh, endorsement of, uh, of the Cervantes in Madrid who look upon it uh, as an absolute blessing. Um, this idea of having an annual lecture uh, was uh, inaugurated last year with Professor Moria de Ellos, uh, who gave an excellent uh, lecture on Churchill and Spain during World War II. Um, and um, it, it, it is a sort of real honor to have the later speaker. I also wanted to thank my own team, Cristina Arvarez, head of our events, and in our secretariat, um, Lisa Chambers and Maria Soriano, uh, who are always a discreet presence and a hardworking presence behind the scenes. So thank you, team. Um, now, guys, uh, we were slightly joking about this uh, early on, but uh, we bumped into each other. We, we tend to bump into each other over the years. And we, in fact, bumped into each other in Barajas just last week. Um, and it was very funny because um, we were catching the same plane and we were waiting as usually slightly delayed. Um, and uh, Guide was looking extremely well, as he always does, and not at all thin, uh, well fed, uh, well, uh, well, well, sort of well with life. Um, and I immediately sort of realized he'd been in Segovia. So my a classic question was, you know, how's the um, cochinillo getting on? But <laughs> Guide with con la simpatía y, y la alegría que siempre tiene said, um, don't mention suckling pig to me. I'm sort of overdosed on it. But um, certainly, as was mentioned by Wittor in his potted uh, biography, um, one of the many uh, aspects of Gaij as a person uh, and as a professional is his multifaceted nature, which I, I hugely enjoy. And, and uh, it's great to be a, a, a friend to him. Um, we've known each other for many years. Uh, the first time I really came across his writing was precisely um, my, my, my mouth-watering uh, experience of reading him writing about um, the best cochinillo he'd ever had uh, and, and the way he threw himself into the gastronomical, gastronomic culture of Spain in a, in a way I hadn't really read uh, done by anybody else. Um, but then I realized as the years went by that there was much more to guide than, than, than simply eating uh, and eating well. Uh, as has been mentioned, he's got an incredible track record uh, as an art historian, uh, as a writer. Um, he started the Courtauld, um, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I don't think you were recruited by Anthony Brunt. I hope you weren't. Uh, Anthony Brunt, as some of you may remember, um, uh, turned out to be a Soviet spy, despite advising the royal family on their paintings. And he was one of the Cambridge Five. Um, but um, guys went on to much greater things, um, uh, not least developing this extraordinary, um, almost Renaissance man character of himself, um, both multicultural, uh, international, uh, and broadening to this extraordinary knowledge um, 
of, of history of art and some of the main players in it, and at the same time being an Hispanista. Um, and I, I just wanted, before sort of handing over to him, just to sort of um, identify a couple of facets of, of his work. Um, he and I both love Sitges. Um, I've got a house there. He's a regular visitor, visitor to Sitges, uh, which, of course, was the um, birthplace of modernismo. Um, Ruiseñor, uh, Utrillo, um, Gaudi was just up the road. Picasso came there. Um, all sorts of extraordinary artists uh, came there. Um, uh, and of course, it was there that Gaij developed this extraordinary expertise, not just on the artists, um, but on their benefactors. And of course, this is something which uh, we've got used to in, in modern times, but uh, some of the great benefactors of these Spanish artists um, were, uh, were American uh, and, and American of great renown, uh, people like Deering, people like Huntington, um, just a few uh, weeks ago, uh, our members uh, benefited for, from an absolute tour de force tour by guide of the Royal Academy uh, of, of Arts um, temporary exhibition of the Hispanic Society collection, um, which he, he almost did it blindfolded because he knew everything that was in it um, and also knew the history about it. And, and he really all our feedback from the members that were there, they were absolutely bowled over by his knowledge, by his passion, by his devotion uh, to the subject. Um, but he's, um, he's here also to obviously to talk about Picasso. And um, apart from, I think, from Gaudi, uh, his, his wonderful work on, uh, Gaj's work on Gaudi uh, and the Sagrada Familia, um, his work on Picasso has been quite, quite extraordinary and has shown its dividends, not just in his writing, but in his cooperation, as was mentioned earlier, with, uh, with amazing TV documentaries uh, which have been done on it. Um, and Picasso, I think, given that it's his 50th anniversary, uh, I mean, one of, of, of Guiche, which had great sort of contributions to our understanding of Picasso, is focusing obviously on his iconic Guernica. Uh, which he's done, I think, in a way that no one else has done. Uh, he's got to the heart and soul of that picture in, in a way that uh, is quite remarkable, and I'm sure he's going to touch on it today. Um, I think, actually, in the world we live in, uh, it, it is good to reflect that Picasso, um, like Gage, uh, it was, it was a huge kind of multicultural, uh, multinational uh, person. Um, he, we know that he was born in Malaga, then he sort of went to Paris, um, but he, he became sort of literally one of the great artistic icons of the 20th century, uh, not least because he lived for so long. Um, and uh, just to, to be slightly humorous at this point, I never forget Private Eye uh, headlining uh, when Picasso died well into his 90s because he was well known for his Chef Chez La Femme. Uh, the title was Sex Maniac Dies in the, um, in the South of France. But I don't know what, Picasso probably had a good Malagueño sense of humour and would have understood what that was about. Um, but that's really all I wanted to say, just to say how uh, honoured and, and, and delighted I am to have you, um, good friend. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And, and I hope you... Uh, you all who are present and zooming in uh, virtually from Spain and, and from other parts of the UK, uh, lots of our members now straddling both countries uh, will enjoy it. I'm sure you will. Thank you very much, Ferrantes. Thank you very much, my team. And guys, over to you, man. Good afternoon. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, and thank you all for coming. Picasso the Spaniard, strange title perhaps, very obvious perhaps, but um, it's not that obvious. I studied at the court of, I did actually study under Anthony Blunt, and his advice to me was, guys, do you want to be taken seriously? 
don't study Spanish art. Uh, do German, do French, do Italian, but steer away from Spanish. And I think perhaps he was a very complex man, that, that Jonathan Brown, the doyen really of, of Spanish art history over in New York, perhaps it was a kind of little battle between the two of them as well. But I think also the spillover of Jonathan Brown discussing Spanish art always as the anti-classical, that it was always eccentric and things that are eccentric perhaps aren't things that you can study as profoundly and as deeply as perhaps the mathematics behind Poussin, which was Anthony Blunt's favorite subject. So when I was 19, I had wonderful John Golding and Chris Green, great Picasso scholars as tutors, and I decided I'd stop doing some reading. And I went into the library in the Courtauld, went into the Spanish room, I could find Goya, I could find El Greco, but I couldn't find a single book on Picasso because he was in the French section of the, and it was a battle that I had working with John Richardson on volume four in the end, really was, it, it became kind of slightly personal in the end because I felt that I really wanted to push for this whole idea of the Spanish identity. And um, I remember writing one bit of research for him and he said, all these Spanish people, they have two surnames, they're far too long. And who are they? And I said, well, one of the people that I've just mentioned is actually a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, the other one is probably the most esteemed kind of philosopher. And it's, ah, oh, okay, perhaps we'll allow them to have two names. And I kind of started looking and discovering that there was a, a very, very strong focus away and also almost an ignoring by Anglo-Saxon art historians of the Spanish contribution to Picasso's studies. So I started doing a little bit of research and then finding, of course, that there's a whole different way of looking at him. But here we are, he's just been uh, made the director of the Museum of the Prado. Um, he's uh, in his 70s, he's sitting there on the beach. Uh, no, he's not in his 70s, he's in his 60s, but he's sitting on the beach there in the south of France. Well, let's start right at the beginning. This wonderful uh, tile, which I I didn't discover, but uh, one day walking into a sherry house, Bodegas Tradición in Jerez, uh, they had amongst their Velasquez and their Goyas and their El Grecos and their Thurbarans, they had this wonderful little tile, this first Spanish kind of almost cliche image uh, that Picasso had done when he was, I think, around about eight or nine years old. We could get him moving then to Barcelona from Malaga. And here in Barcelona, he becomes one of the iconic figures of El Scatregaz. Uh, it's where he has his first one-man show. Uh, and... Uh, it's wonderful, of course, because it also shows that what Picasso had always said is the greatest artist is the greatest kleptomaniac. Uh, you've just got to know what to steal. And what he was stealing was Steinlern and, and, and uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, and bringing this kind of French fin uh, de siècle, uh, kind of belle époque elegance. And there he is sitting there in the front row, himself looking out from the menu. Well, very soon, he starts finding and looking at much deeper sources. And it's interesting, his father, who was a very classically trained artist in Malaga, who was famous for his pigeon paintings, was very worried when Picasso, as a 19-year-old, goes down to Madrid, and he sends a spy, uh, another artist, a friend of his, Munoz de Gran, who writes back a letter to the father saying, oh, I've got some terrible news. And when you've got a 19-year-old, so what do you think is the terrible news? He's drinking or he's taking drugs or he's womanizing. No, it was much, much worse. He was looking at El Greco. <laughs> um, and, and of course, El Greco was at that stage very little known and seen as a kind of eccentric. And it's really through the eyes of the German expressionists, particularly, and of course, Santiago Rossignol uh, and Ignacio Zuluaga, that we get El Greco kind of brought into the fore. And here we have a sketch had really of him uh, Grecoizing faces. 
here we've got the interior homage to both you and, and uh, yes. Jimmy, both of you who are citrus lovers, the Galferrat, Santiago Rossignol's home. And some of the first paintings that Picasso ever did, there's a little bullfight one there on the right hand side of uh, that was bought from that first exhibition. Um, it's an extraordinary place, but it already shows that Picasso is learning very fast because Rossignol was everything. He was a dramatist. He was a great journalist. He was a theatre impresario. He was an impresario full stop. He was an extraordinary collector. He was a collector who was totally kind of uh, across the board. Medieval ironwork, uh, beautiful paintings, and of course that great first Festus Modernista of uh, in Sitges in uh, 1893, where he uh, introduces the two Grecos that he's bought and brings the art world of Barcelona down to Sitges to see them put in place. Well, uh, this is something I, I stole, not stole, but I, I, I told John I wanted to have a photo of it. It was a, it was a homage that he had given uh, to John Richardson, who'd found it in a, in a shop in, in Paris and took it to Pablo, who signed it uh, for John, mon, mon ami aussi, uh, putting him in with his early friends. And the most important one in the picture there is the tall one on the right, Carlos Casagemas. And Carlos Casagemas, who dies uh, the following year, he uh, falls in love with a prostitute. Uh, not a good move, in a sense, for, for eternal love. Uh, breaks his heart. He goes down. Picasso takes him to Malaga. Malaga doesn't cure him, and he runs away and goes back to Paris, tries to shoot her, fails, and shoots himself. And Picasso, in a sense, never really got over the death of Casagemas, and it kind of sits there always behind him, alongside the death of Conchita, his sister. Well, what I thought was how similar some of Picasso's work was already to the Tremendismo, the, the extraordinary graphic power of some of the polygram sculpture, which, of course, we were incredibly lucky to have been introduced to here in England by Xavier Bray at the National Gallery a few years ago with the, uh, the sacred uh, image. Uh, and this is Gregorio Hernandez from Segovia Cathedral, my local saint who comes out, of course, in Holy Week. But also importantly, we do have the letters, the commission letters. And it says that, uh, that Gregory Hernandez has to go and attend three or four masses a year to recharge the image. So the idea already that when Anglo-Saxon art historians are looking for where does Picasso get the power, they immediately go to the primitive art, now no longer we call it primitive, but oceanic art or art from Nigeria or, or, or these extraordinarily powerful masks, which he would later use, but you don't need to You've already got it in the idea that Spanish art and the art, particularly of the Golden Age, has a kind of uh, an extraordinary power. Uh, I mean, uh, Tapies would say many years later that that uh, for him the most perfect work of art is, is if he touched it, it would heal. The idea that there is something very deep in that uh, power of the creator. So here we have him Grecoizing. The death of Casagemas. This is very <laughs> clearly uh, relates to uh, our Conde Orgas, which we've got here in uh, Toledo. And we can see that kind of play there. And Picasso just changes whatever he wants, but is still working with that kind of uh, relationship between the past. Now, of course, I could, if I wanted to, have changed this entirely this lecture and started looking at very many different other sources. We know that he was a kleptomaniac. We know that he also had this extraordinary capacity for remembering, as Sabates, his secretary, said of him, he never forgets anything unless he really wants to, and then he forgets it perfectly. Uh, and that's normally yeah. complicated relationships. But he certainly knew his Spanish art inside out. 
And so in 1936, when he was made a, the director of the Prada in absentia, because he was in Paris, it was in a sense acknowledging already that what he had done uh, for the Prado was uh, brought it into the land of the great museums already, the Louvre, the National Gallery here in London, and of course the rising metropolitan in New York. So again, another uh, way that he uses El Greco, it's the great opening of the fifth seal, which uh, Zuluaga found when he was traveling around Cordoba with Auguste Rodin. And Rodin tried to persuade him that it was a bad picture, he shouldn't buy it because part of it was rotted off uh, so that we don't actually see the full painting. But uh, Zuluaga loved it so much, he took it to Paris and in his salons, Picasso could see it kind of once a week if he turned up. And it's clear that that is somewhere, and particularly in the colors behind the Arguably most important painting of the first part of the 20th century, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, that we know was a painting of a brothel scene in Avignon Street in Barcelona, uh, but it's really this kind of brutalizing and fetishizing of the figures on the right hand side. He's kind of turning them into African masks and splaying around and actually seeing already the birth of Cubism, the way that everything breaks up in splinters. You can see the background, the curtains, making these kind of uh, extraordinary powerful shard shapes as if you are seeing it through a broken glass. Well, in 1917, he is just married for the first time. He takes his bride to see his mother in Barcelona. He takes her to the bullfight. He does what he does with many women is he that transforms them into his ideal of what a Spanish beauty is. So here is the Russian, Olga Poklova, who he paints here in very classical style in 1917. She's been at that bullfight, seen the horse disemboweled, and she's kind of slightly hollow eyed. It was only recently actually, and it was quite shockingly in a sense for us when, when Bernard Picasso came to visit John and I in, in New York and he brought some of the photos. I never realized that Olga actually just a few weeks before she got married, fell over, broke her hip uh, and would never dance again. She was going to be the prima ballerina of the Diaghilev's Ballet Russe. And so there's a kind of sensitivity and sadness already that is built into these images as if kind of a melancholy, I mean, it's almost the, the kind of the ennui of, of France, but then uh, added to with, with that knowledge of, of, of what actually happened to Olga. Well, Picasso didn't go back to Spain very often, but in 1934, he gets invited to a fascist food club uh, called GU, G-E-U, in San Sebastián. And it's an extraordinary moment still where everything is possible. The left and the right can still sit in the same room and talk to each other. And it's very poignant that you see different figures from the left and right. Uh, Federico Garcia Lorca, we've got Pablo Neruda who comes there, but also we have this very strange figure uh, here on the left-hand side, Ernesto Jiménez Caballero, uh, Gethe. He was a literary critic, uh, Picasso. He would end up as Franco's speechwriter. Uh, he was uh, brilliant, but kind of slightly deranged as well. But Picasso just couldn't not meet the man who had written uh, this extraordinary article about him, describing him as the sperm bank of Andalusia, the great minotaur, the great beast, the creative monster, the priapic you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so he goes to meet Ernesto Jiménez Caballero, and who comes along but Juan Antonio Primo de Rivera, uh, who turns up and apparently Jiménez Caballero reports that uh, he had never met anybody with such burning eyes as Pablo Picasso since he'd sat at table with Benito Mussolini. Uh, Picasso was unhappy and felt very 
strange about it. And although uh, there's some disputes about it, but I, I did, uh, you know, kind of discover the actual newspaper reports. I'm absolutely certain that he pretty well the next day decides that he's going to go back to France. I mean, it was on his schedule anyway, that he was going to go back to Paris. But Jiménez Caballero writes it as if he'd won him over for the right in Spain, and therefore the, the most prolific, potent, uh, the most powerful, famous artist of the 20th century is now a Francoist. Well, we know that that wasn't true. Let's carry on. We go to comes back to France and he does this very extraordinary enigmatic etching, the Minotaur Maki. Uh, at different times of his life, Picasso takes on different personalities. In the 1900s, he's the Harlequin, the outsider. Uh, in the 1930s, he becomes the Minotaur, he becomes the monster, he becomes uh, or associates with the power of the beast. And so we could look at that as a uh, self-portrait. Uh, we know that there's a girl there with a the candle, that she's been described as either uh, Conchita, his sister, or perhaps Marie-Thérèse, his lover at the time. Um, in <clears> fact, <throat> uh, I went to see Maya, the daughter, once in, uh, in her apartment in Paris, opposite the Louvre. I said, look at what my father was like. The first time he ever painted me, I'm in the stomach of my mother, the female matador, lying over the bull's back, and there I am being killed by the minotaur figure. Uh, and uh, she kind of said, that's typical of my father. Um, well, of course, we go straight from the minotaur to the beginnings of the Spanish Civil War. We know that Picasso accepted in September 36, the position as the director of the uh, Prado uh, in the uh, Gazeta. They had to do it, uh, print it two weeks on the trot because they got one of his 26 Christian names the wrong way round. Uh, and uh, so they repeat, but this is the first bombings that were taking place in Madrid. This is uh, in the autumn of 36 when the Prado was being bombed, uh, as we can see, it took eight direct hits. Uh, fortunately, nothing was badly damaged, and that would happen later, but it was very well organized. Uh, sculptures were sandbagged and, and uh, in the basement and protected, and the rest went down to Valencia and would eventually go up to Barcelona. And in fact, in 39, on the, one of the lorries that was taking uh, Goya's 2nd and 3rd of May, crashed in, going through a village, crashed into a, a balcony and was very badly damaged. But pretty well everything got uh, to the border in uh, July, January of 1939, ready to take over. Uh, it was Gregorio Marañón who said that the only way they managed to get to safety in Geneva was that Pablo Picasso himself paid for the train because the Republican government no longer had enough money to actually get a train to take the whole collection there. He was extraordinarily generous. Uh, and that's something again, which is coming out now. He paid for uh, milk banks in Barcelona for the children. He paid for schools and hospitals in Toulouse and in the south of France. He tried to get as many of the Spanish artists that he knew who were in the camps uh, to get them out. Well, uh, Giuseppe Renau, uh, the great Valencian, uh, what do we call him? Uh, you know, a, a poster designer, uh, but he was also the director of Bellas Artes, goes to visit him and asks him in Paris in uh, January of 37, if he will do something for the great pavilion that is going to take place. And Picasso says, I don't really do politics. He says, well, P Pablo, you've already accepted the director of the Prado, and that's a very political statement. Please do something. And what he does on the 8th of January is, of course, the famous dream and lie of Franco. And it's this series of etchings. I mean, these are all done within this hard point incredibly difficult to do, and he does this within half a day. 
uh, the actual series. He does it so fast that he forgets that when you put it in reverse, that you get the date the wrong way around. This is actually how he did it. Uh, and, and so also we have to read it from right to left uh, rather than the other way around. We've got Frank on the top sitting on a horse. He then paints him as a kind of turd-like phallic figure crossing the Straits of Gibraltar. He smashes the classical sculpture up. He then desecrates uh, different things and ends up there as a beata on the left-hand side middle row as a holy woman praying to the host, but the host is actually a duro, a, a piece of money. And then finally, at the bottom, Franco goes riding off into the sunset. Well, it's savage, it's brutal. It fits into the kind of uh, uh, language of surrealism, but it was something that, that Franco, of course, could never forgive. And what, of course, what he could never forgive is the beginnings of his work on Guernica. And this is something which I discovered and thought was actually fascinating, that in the weekends he would be painting Marie-Thérèse uh, out in the country with their little daughter, Maya. Uh, and they're mostly happy pictures, but there's this one, which is a kind of brooding painting that relates directly to this Goya. Uh, uh, El Sueño, uh, you know, the, 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 the dream of what well, is actually a nightmare. These, these things are kind of in, in, in invading the brain of uh, Goya, the artist, as perhaps uh, they are doing to Marie-Thérèse, who's being taken now out of a kind of homely atmosphere and transformed into this rather worrying individual. Well, of course, we know that on the 26th of uh, April 1937, that the bombing of Guernica takes place. What again has only just come out is a, a brilliant book by uh, a, a Basque uh, writer who lives in America, Xavier Urujo, who, I mean, it's chilling, but the bombing of Guernica was actually a birthday present from Goering to Hitler. Uh, it was four days late because uh, von Richthofen didn't realize that, or had worked out that there wasn't enough incendiary bombs uh, that they'd got in Vitoria uh, and Burgos uh, to actually do the job properly. And so four days later, they do the job properly, which is 96 to 97% of the building stock is completely destroyed in Guernica, apart from the many people that died. And it's probable that there are far more than we uh, have ever thought uh, it was organized also as a Wagnerian ring of fire, uh, 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 so that first of all, the planes arrive across so that they, people go into the bunkers, they then bomb the water tanks first of all, so the fires can't be put out. When the people come up half an hour later, the next lot of planes come over, and that's when the real damage takes place. And it's astonishing, it's absolutely chilling, but this is, of course, the news and the image that the world would see the next day. And it's what inspires then Picasso, who was still bereft of a subject for the large painting. He knew the size of the painting. He'd already got it stretched up, uh, but he didn't know what he was going to do. He'd tried in April the 16th. What can I do? I'll do artist in studio, the kind of light motif that he would always use to get his creative juice running. And that uh, just didn't work. And then, of course, he gets the subject and he starts here, the first sketch of all. And I think it's interesting, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but Picasso himself said, wouldn't it be fascinating to see how a painting, the evolution of a painting, how from the first idea, actually right to the end and completion doesn't really change that much. It just goes through different transformations. And we know, because his lover, Dora Ma, was taking photographs of the process and, and actually helping with some of the painting of Guernica. Well, here we have Pablo. Uh, this very interesting moment, and this is one of the things which I thought very strongly about when I was talking with John, was there was always this story that when Pablo was got down from the ladder, he went into the street and he bumped into Henry Moore and Penrose. And they said, what are you doing? And they said, come up and have a look. And they have lunch next to the painting. 
and Henry Moore in his broad Yorkshire accent and Picasso in his non-existent English uh, could only communicate in a kind of sign language. And so to show Henry Moore what he wanted to transmit in the painting, he runs off to the toilet and grabs a piece of toilet paper and sticks it into the hand of the woman coming in on the right hand side of the painting. He says it's as if there's no time to wipe your when the bombs arrive. Uh, Henry Moore understood it. And that was the story that everybody transmitted and everybody reported again and again. Until just a few years ago, I was reading a, an extraordinary book by a person who influenced Picasso a lot, Jose Bergamin. And Bergamin uh, reports how at that lunchtime, first of all, Picasso was going to paint it in color. And Bergamin said, to him, no, 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 Pablo, Pablo, don't. He said, yeah, no, but I, I've, I've got to see if it works. He said, you're the man who invented cubism and papier colle. Why don't you just get wallpaper and stick it on and then you can see with the wallpaper if it works. And we do have a photo which is in the, uh, in, in the uh, Reina Sofia actually of that, which was stuck on for about half an hour and then taken off because Picasso realizes it, it doesn't have the power. But um, so he, he uh, Bergamin, uh, Picasso goes and he paints a tear, a beautiful, beautiful tear, which he gives him in a little box, like a reliquary. He says every Friday at four o'clock in the afternoon with the crucifixion, you have to take this tear and put it in the exhibition onto any of the eyes that you see fit. Now, Bergamin lost the eye, and we only have the story about it. But you can see already that Picasso is seeing a kind of fusion of religious imagery with the bullfight, with different rituals, which are all overlaid, and there's a kind of chaos about it, as if it's a ritual which has just gone very, very badly wrong. Uh, we can see the figure on the left-hand side. In earlier uh, versions, the head was the other way around, and it was a self-portrait of Pablo Picasso himself. He then transforms it around. We've got the broken sword and then that little flower that is just growing out of the fist on the right-hand side. Well, we can look at the disasters, for instance, uh, of Goya uh, and his thinking about the, the, the war that had taken, the Peninsula War, uh, the War of Independence uh, in Spain and his reactions to that, to see that there is a common language. And of course, the common language is there as well. Uh, if we go to that painting that was badly damaged in that lorry crash, where in fact, you can still in the Prado to see today, there's a big rip which goes and cuts almost around the soldiers actually stitched up actually en route before it got to Geneva and the restorers could have time to look after it. But this idea of a modern Calvary, uh, the Christ-like figure, and if you look at his hands there uh, of the soldier being, uh, the person being shot, the uh, rebellious uh, Madrileño, uh, you can actually see the stigmata marks are actually in his hand when you go up and look closely. So. There's a common thread there. Another common thread is one of the most famous pictures in the Prado, which all the surrealists loved. Well, that is the outside of it, or that's when it's closed. And this is when it's open, the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, two very different worlds. And I think, again, this is something that Picasso is tapping into. The one thing I think that he was really tapping into, uh, the these extraordinary uh, sheets, uh, linen mostly, which uh, called sargas, which are produced for Holy Week in Spain um, because they're so fragile, there's so few left. Uh, but you had in front of the high altar, pulled up on ropes, this huge grisaille painting, which then when Christ rises on Easter Sunday, it suddenly drops down and the high altar in all its glory with all its wonderful Baroque Solomonic things and this wonderful polychrome imagery suddenly comes alive again. And I think he's tapping into that kind of 
DNA of sadness. I mean, in Spain, we all know how powerful Holy Week is and how for many people it is the actual meaning of the year and the meaning of their life. And we can see that Picasso, was he or wasn't he uh, 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 religious? Well, Jacqueline, his wife would say, il est plus catholique que le pape, uh, much more Catholic than the Pope. And we do actually know, and I found uh, an archive in America where there's a letter from Sabates uh, saying that he now gives much more money to the Catholic church than he gives to all the other charities. Well, that we still <coughs> haven't uh, yet proven. But what we do know is that when he went uh, back to France in, in uh, uh, 36 and just after the Spanish War, Civil War, this is the um, right at the end, the camps which were on the south coast of uh, France. Uh, this is Barcer, photo by Robert Kappa, of the terrible conditions uh, that many of the people were left in these camps. Extraordinarily, they uh, almost immediately uh, set up an open university in sand pits. They were being pebble dashed by sand. It was one of the coldest winters, huge winds going across the Mistral. And they were also teaching poetry and they were doing exhibitions because in fact sponsored an exhibition. And I've never yet found photos of it, uh, but descriptions certainly where all the people out of driftwood, out of barbed wire, out of anything, were creating these uh, extraordinary little works of art. Well, night fishing at Antibes is just one of those paintings which I think gives again this feeling of darkness, of going back again to the sardine fishermen in, in, in uh, particularly uh, around uh, uh, Barcelona, the Barceloneta, and bringing it up to date, but with these very dark purple, kind of almost, uh, it's, it's a kind of palette of sadness. Uh, and um, we move on now to the most extraordinary part of the story, which I think happens in 1957. His wife, Jacqueline, she's just had a hysterectomy, he has decided that he's going to revive himself at the age of 75. His father died at 75, and he's going to take on the whole of Spanish art once again. It's an extraordinary moment. He has three friends, the three closest friends, who are living with him almost on a day-to-day -day basis. This is Hélène Parmelin. Uh, she is a spy for the KGB, informing on Picasso. Uh, on the other side, informing directly to Franke was his closest friend, Dominguin, uh, who was going on hunting trips with Franco at the weekends. And in the summers he would be, because Miguel Bosé uh, was, his godfather was, uh, was uh, Pablo Picasso. And there's Lucia Bosé uh, with Dominguin. Picasso actually knew this, and, and I, with, a, with an extraordinary chance encounter, uh, I met about three summers ago, just in uh, my local village, a man called Emilio de Diego, who is the guitarist who you see opening Blood Wedding. Picasso had always wanted to meet him and Antonio Gades. And Dominguin arranges for them to play flamenco in the Cannes Film Festival. And the only place that they, Emilio could find uh, where they could get for the day was a Chinese takeaway. And there's these two Chinese people in the background in the photos looking utterly bewildered, <laughs> seeing Gades, Picasso, Dominguin. And I said, did you notice anything strange? So, well, when Rafael Alberti walked in, Alberti and, uh, and Picasso just kept on joking to Dominguin, saying, you right-wing fascist. Uh, and they said it was like schoolboys together. And it was clear, he said, that he absolutely knew that he was being watched. But the strangest of all was an American photographer, David Douglas Duncan, who was informing on Picasso directly to Vice President Richard Nixon, <laughs> who writes to him and says, and this is a letter to the Vice President, hey buddy, uh, I really know this Pablo guy well. Uh, if we get him on the back of a horse, he loves the Wild West, we can win him for the West. You'd think there would never be a response. I've actually got on my computer the response from Nixon, who says, well, officially, of course, as, as the famous communist, he's not allowed to come to America. 
but I'm sure we can organize something with some of our friends to get them over, i.e. the Rockefellers or one of the grand families who could just send a, a private plane. Well, what happens? Uh, it's exactly this year that Picasso, uh, or rather the Spanish ambassadors around the world, wherever Pica Guernica is displayed, right back to the foreign office complaining that it's bad press for them. Uh, and is there no way we can kind of somehow bring Picasso around? And they decide, ah, let's play to his ego. Let's offer him an exhibition at the Prado and at the new Contemporary Art Museum over by the University in Madrid. We'll see if he takes it. And they set up a fake kind of board of trustees. Someone goes over to try and persuade Pablo Picasso. He does smell a rat. But it's very interesting that already in the 50s, mid 50s, he becomes the touchstone for the Spanish artists who still hadn't left Spain. And one wonderful seminar I uh, was working with um, Beba Toussel and uh, Juan Gaspar, who was the dealer for Picasso in Barcelona. And Juan said, well, in the 1950s, I set up a, a special tourist company in Barcelona to visit, Bar to visit Picasso, but it was, we would all go to pilgrimage to Lourdes. So at Perpignan, half the people jumped off the bus. The other half went to Lourdes, bought rosary beads enough for everybody so that when they came back together again, they would come back. And the people that went were the people that Picasso still wanted to show that he was up to the mark, that he still had the cojones to take on the greatest single artist and the greatest single painting I think that's ever been created, Las Meninas by Velázquez. And like Picasso, uh, you know, Picasso rather, he immediately starts to kick it and pull it apart, to deconstruct it. He, uh, I remember John uh, and Douglas Cooper, there's a photograph of them sitting downstairs having lunch with, with Jacqueline, she was ill, so it was a bedside lunch. Uh, they put the table by, and I said, uh, John, what, do you, what, do, what did you eat that day? He said, what a silly question. I said, yeah, but you always give me this stock answer. What did you eat that day? He says, I don't know, but you know what? I think that I remember now, Picasso said to me, if Jean Cocteau comes in, don't kiss him. I'm only <laughs> allowing him to come in for coffee because if you kiss him, you'll catch something very nasty he caught from the Germans during the Second World War. And Picasso was very, very sensitive to the politics and the issues. And this is the first work, the largest work, but again, we can see how, where Velasquez had put himself at half size, now we've got this modern version of the great court painter, who's now fills the whole canvas, and he's actually got a Darlinian wonderful mustache. And this is exactly this moment that Salvador Dali goes to visit Franco, comes out wearing his vac, his, his wonderful, uh, elegant things from the Pardo Palace, says like, he's never met a man who's more sensitive to art than Francisco Franco. And uh, equally that uh, he's going to ask the Bishop of Barcelona to say a mass to save Picasso's soul. And he's going to send a submarine to kidnap him uh, <laughs> uh, when he goes to Avignon next time round. So I think what I've wanted to do is see that right even to the end with these, I think some of his most magnificent works, it's taken us so long to understand them. And it's thanks in a sense to people like Julian Schnabel and Basquiat that we've now got a kind of eye for how daring and extraordinary these images are for a 90 year old man to be producing. Uh, and we see him now playing the Spaniard uh, and of course the final picture which he painted just before he died, this harrowing, very self-flagellatory, uh, extraordinarily powerful image. Thank you. Uh, question. Any questions? Where is that one? That one is in um, in Malaga, uh, in the uh, Christine and Bernard Picasso 
um, donation that they gave to Malik, which is which kind of changes. Uh, sometimes they add and uh, but um, it's it's an incredible museum. And of course, this year we've got some of the best exhibitions around the world really devoted to uh, devoted to Picasso. I mean, it's amazing. He produced thirty seven thousand original works of art in his life. That's two and a half per day <laughs> for 91 years. <laughs> what was his second surname? Uh, Ruiz. He's, in fact, I mean, he, he starts, he signs his early paintings as Pablo Ruiz Picasso. And he then drops his father's name, the Ruiz. And he's asked why he does it. And he says, well, all the great artists in the world have two S's, Picasso, Matisse, <laughs> which I think is a wonderful answer. But I mean, there's of course a lot of Freudian analysis that's gone on the idea of that you have to kill your father and, and that he was in a sense ashamed of his father's, uh, you know, pigeon paintings and that his father was a kind of late 19th century Victorian artist, which he was, I think he's done some lovely paintings, but. Picasso wanted something different. He wanted to permanently, or needed to. Um, Gertrude Stein said he's like a well. And whenever you draw off the water, the water comes back and he's always emptying himself. Yes. When you mentioned Casa Guemas earlier, yes. uh, there's a painting at the Tate and I was there a few uh, weeks ago, uh, done by Picasso. I think it's of three women. The three dancers. Yeah, and, and, then, you, and you see the shadow of Carlos Casagamas in between the arms of the woman. Yeah. Well, that is what the guy was saying. But yeah. then there was also the woman who's bent over with a red lipstick that had kind of a frightful <laughs> look yeah, to yeah. her. And... Yeah, and that's probably Germaine Pichot, who was the 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 uh, mistress or uh, the prostitute who. Who then does marry another Picasso friend? I can't remember how that one worked. But... <laughs> yes, sorry. Thank you for a wonderful, enthusiastic introduction or talk or an appreciation. I'm sort of marvelous. I asked this question, and it's not because I'm particularly concerned, but do you think he's safe from wokery? <laughs> well, you well, no, no, I mean, it's. it's, 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 it's 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 very very complex. Um, I mean, there's a there's a BBC series coming out in the autumn, uh, and I, I'm, I think I'm going to be on number two and number three. And they said, well, while you're here, would you like to talk about that? And I said, I don't think I would be of any use to you. Why don't you ask a female art historian what she feels? Uh, there's been an exhibition, I think it's in Brooklyn at the moment, uh, where a woman artist has done her reflections on this. And it's been getting an absolute savaging in the press. Now, um, I mean, it's, it's very, it's a, it's a hugely complex issue because uh, he clearly had difficult relationships, particularly with family and friends uh close friends he was very very generous to other people and very kind and very caring um you know i think his mother put it you know right at the beginning said if he'd if he'd have gone into the church he would have ended up as the pope uh if he'd gone into the army he would have been a field marshal but he went into art and he became picasso mm -hmm. well if you've got a mother who thinks that already uh and puts you up on the pedestal and actually your talent matches expectations as it did. Uh, it's not to say he's beyond criticism, but far, far from it. But I think it has to be done in a much more subtle way. And I think there has to be a rebalancing of the obsession with Picasso seen through his women and through sexuality, because I think he's also very interested in politics. He's very interested in so many other things which then gets swept away. This, for someone who is so complex, um, to simplify, I think just and to, to reduce it to that, is is I think a mistake. 
which Father Collectus grasped very early on, just how great an artist he was. Uh, he was always angry with Gertrude that she got his drawings cheap. Um, the first real collectors were actually uh, German collectors in Munich, and, and of course the Russians, uh, Morisov and Shukin. And in fact, there's a brilliant book uh, which has just come out by someone who worked at the Museum of Modern Art, Hugh Aiken. Uh, Picasso's War. And it's about actually how long Picasso took to really get under the skin of the American collectors. And once that took place in the late 1930s uh, and the 1940s, then that really did kind of take off. Having, of course, Guernica in New York, uh, where it was from 1939 on until 71, uh, no, not 71, 81, uh, of course, meant, and he loved the idea that the fifth column, his painting was there in New York, uh, uh, kind of critiquing not just the Spanish Civil War, but also critiquing, in a sense, the brutality of the 20th capitalist century. Um, yeah. Yes. I was just wondering, um, apropos to his um, question or comment, did the Germans, you know, during Hitler's time, consider any of his art degenerate? Uh, or he was in a different period? No, no, no. I think, you know, I'm sure that they, he was absolutely associated with that whole degenerate art uh, show, which in 33, where the work of particularly of the German expressionists was put alongside photographs of patients in asylums and uh, to show that this art was descending into uh, what they saw as um, focusing on degeneracy um, and that this was something that Picasso was also associated with. I mean, in the, in the 1950s in America, he was, he was regarded as very, very dangerous by the, by the KGB, I mean, by the CIA, who, uh, who felt that he and Jackson Pollock were, Jackson Pollock's drip paintings were all maps for the Russians to know where they were going to. Uh, yes. But no, absolutely, no, seriously. And that Picasso was infecting the minds of American youth. And um, that, was, that was the kind of official policy from the CIA. You mentioned he was, the comment about a North Catholic with a plug. Do you know what respective popes made of his output and, and are there any of them hanging on any Vatican I'm, 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 I mean I would love one day somehow to be able to get into the Vatican archives and see he apparently after he painted a massacre in Korea in 55 Sabates says that he had been excommunicated and that that had that it had really upset him incredibly and that therefore he was now going to start giving money. I'm, I found absolutely no proof. That's just in a letter that Sabatez wrote. Uh, now, whether that Sabatez is kind of slightly joking because they didn't have an ease, they had a, a, a very strong relationship, but it was a, always a lot of joking going on, trying to prod each other. Yes, sorry. A wonderful lecture, thank you. Um, I have thank you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning Jerez de la Frontera. Yeah. But I know Picasso was um, four or five years in Coruña. I don't know if we yes. know something about those years when he started also painting. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, he was in Coruña from he, from when he was nine to about 14 and starts a little art magazine at school mm -hmm. and does some very beautiful early, very dark paintings, one which is actually in the Barcelona Museum uh, of a fisherman, and it looks like a classic kind of St. Peter as the fisherman. Um, but it's really when he starts in Barcelona, he says that he finds himself really when he goes out to uh, Horta uh, on the Aragonese border uh, for a summer and just kind of finds his own identity there. And so La Coruña, I think, was a, his father was uh, not happy there uh, as an art teacher, and also that's where Conchita dies. And uh, 
So there's the whole kind of myth of that Picasso is alleged to have prayed for her. She was dying of diphtheria that if he stopped painting, she would survive. And that the next morning he has to pick up his brush and she dies that afternoon. And, you know, many people have talked about that being as, a, as which understandably so, uh, kind of a very a deep, traumatic uh, kind of pain which he carried with him. What time do the African masks really start to have a major influence? Um, well, uh, Durin and Matisse are really starting to collect in 1905-1906. But I think also here, the very important thing, and I, you know, you could keep adding more and more, but I mean, is the discovery, of course, of the Iberian uh, at, uh, in, just outside Merida. Uh, these extraordinary kind of hieratic heads from the Ibero culture, which are shown in the, shown in the Louvre, uh, uh, not in the Louvre, in the, um, uh, Trocadero in 1906, 1907, when he's working on Gertrude Stein's, and he transforms Gertrude Stein into this kind of Dama de Elche, but much more simplified and blockish. The Hispanic Society, you know, the one that they had at the yes, yes. it didn't have a Picasso. Uh, you know, Greco, Alberto, and Goya, and all of that. No, he. You know, Huntington kind of stopped really with with Zuloga and particularly Soroya, mm -hmm. who was his who was his favorite artist. Um, a little bit like Frick as well would only have one living artist in his collection. Uh, the Frick in New York. Yes, the yeah. Frick, Whistler was the only living artist that he had in his collection. With Picasso, what kind of drove him to keep changing? I mean, he was very prolific. But his style, you know, from the early days to the last were very, you know, changed, I guess. Yeah, I think he just had experimentalism as his DNA. Uh, and if a finished work is dead, once you found the once you found the solution, why would you repeat? I think that was one of his kind of you see so many artists who find their style in their 20s or 30s. And they just spend the rest of their life almost doing the similar kind of things. Whereas Picasso, that's what I think is so remarkable about those last series, the Moscateros, is that he's daring to do something when all the newspapers are writing about him as, as being, you know, senile. And in fact, is, you know, that, that you know, that, that uh, this is just, you know, that we're seeing a man who has completely lost everything. And in fact, I think we've someone who's actually found everything, but it's just a very simple, powerful language that he speaks at the end. Yes. Yes, that's what I want to say. Thank you for the title of this uh, uh, conference, the Picasso de España, because most of people um, associate uh, Picasso with France. It's, it's true. No? Yeah. It's like uh, we need to reclaim a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You are a painter, no? So um, I, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting because uh, yeah, in, during the presentation, your presentation, we can um, uh, link the all the uh, the, the Picasso's work with very significant uh, paintings in, in Spain, no? uh, in the Museo del Prado, uh, Velázquez. It's very interesting. So thank you very much for associating uh, Picasso again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs>